Welcome to 18th century Nantucket. Over the next nine episodes, I'll be guiding you through the American Revolution's effect on the island and its people. During our journey, we'll be running into founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. We'll also talk about how the island tried to remain neutral during the war, partly because of business interests and partly because, quite frankly, most of us are Quaker pacifists. We'll also discuss the longer term ramifications of the war and how whaling on the island was never quite the same again. But first, let's start with some good news. During the early part of the 1770s, our tiny island continued expanding into an economic powerhouse. On average, Nantucket sent out about 150 ships each year, setting sail as far as the Falkland Islands and bringing back about 26,000 gallons of sperm oil annually. <laughs> Don't worry, we didn't let it get to our heads. Nantucketer and ridiculously rich businessman Joseph Roach, along with his son William, spearheaded this whaling expansion, with the family owning everything from ships to harpoons. Given this control of the whaling industry, some did call their business practices unethical. But I say, what's wrong with opening your own candleworks, in addition to having a monopoly on whaling? Conflict of interest? Pfft. More like smart businessmen. Over the years, some tried to stop the Roach whaling monopoly, including one John Hancock. Both parties sent the price of whale oil skyrocketing and plummeting for a number of years before Hancock lost so much money he had to move from business to politics. Turns out, that worked out pretty well for him. Anyway, in 1773, Roach's luck started to run out as he became tangled in an event called the Tea Party. As you might imagine, didn't end well. The Tea Party may have had an innocent sounding name. Unfortunately for Nantucketers, this event wasn't so much a party as much as it was a total economic disaster with lasting political implications. On the night of December 16, 1773, a group called the Sons of Liberty promised to make Boston Harbor a teapot in response to England's taxation without representation. Who was in the Sons of Liberty, you may ask? Well, some of the members included Paul Revere, Samuel Adams, and even John Hancock. You know, the guy who the Roaches just ran out of business. And while Nantucketers weren't taking sides in the conflict, there was one major problem. It turns out that the Roaches, coincidentally, owned two of the three ships that lost more than 90,000 pounds of tea on that night. The Sons of Liberty did feel bad that Roach was stuck in the middle, and they decided to sweep the decks of his ships to show it was nothing personal. Oh yeah, thanks guys, you're the real heroes. With that said, it's clear that the anger between Massachusetts and England was only just beginning, and Hancock wasn't the only founding father Roach would eventually be tangling with. After an action-packed Tea Party episode involving two of our major trading partners, Nantucketers hoped to go back to exactly the way things were. While mainland Massachusetts struggled with Britain's high taxes, we were quite happy living off of whaling in the pocketbooks of the Roach family. With that said, both sides became increasingly impatient that we were trying to remain neutral. On one hand, Massachusetts declared us Tories, and on the other, Britain said we needed to do more to stand up to the colonies. The truth is, we just needed someone to trade whale oil with. Plus, we're Quaker pacifists. We can't even go dancing or play the piano. What makes you think we could fight a revolutionary war? Unfortunately, England seemed to have other ideas. In August of 1775, they set up a blockade around the island and ordered our ships to stay in port. Even Nantucket ships that got through the blockade were likely to be caught on their way back, and many of our sailors were captured and put on prison ships. In short, Nantucketers faced an impossible decision. With no end in sight, we needed to choose between our pacifism and our business. Before the Revolutionary War, Nantucket's population stood at nearly 5,000 people. Because of ferociously cold winters and a lack of trade, about 1,600 islanders have died during the war, along with half of our sheep. You could say things are going... bad. To make matters worse, a new alien duty created a steep import tax on all U.S. goods sold to England. That meant whale oil was too expensive to sell to Britain, and it was already too expensive for a war-ravaged Massachusetts. So we were on to plan B, growing crops in Nantucket's inhospitable soil. 
As you can imagine, that didn't go well. William Roach had his own set of problems, losing up to $100,000 during the conflict. If that wasn't enough, Massachusetts declared high treason against him for speaking to a British military official, and he barely escaped execution. With that said, things on the island weren't as bad as they could be, thanks to some successful smuggling of food and other goods back to the island. In the next episode, we'll talk about one of the most successful Nantucket smugglers, Keziah Coffin. Despite her best efforts, trying to farm on sandy soil wasn't going as planned. This meant that Nantucketers were ready to pay for any additional food we could get our hands on, regardless of price. Enter Keziah Coffin, who utilized the American Revolution to make significant profits by smuggling goods back to the island. Keziah wasn't the only Nantucketer who got into smuggling, which was an extremely dangerous line of work. As we mentioned before, the price for Nantucketers caught during the war was a trip aboard England's prison ships, where the food contained maggots and the water smelled, quote, filthy and poisonous. Not exactly tea and biscuits, guys. While many on the island struggled to get by, Keziah thrived during the revolution, selling highly priced foods, everything ranging from apples and cherries to deerskin and cheeses. Two years into the war, she even built a new home near the beach, likely to help with her smuggling process. Unfortunately, Keziah's good fortune eventually ended, and like William Roach, she was accused of high treason in 1780. Although she was never convicted, she faced a number of lawsuits in the years to come, and her home was eventually seized after the Revolutionary War. Keziah then traveled to Nova Scotia, filing for restitution against the British government. She spent time in a debtor's prison before returning to the island where she lived until her death in 1798. Unfortunately for Nantucket whalers, the Roach's time on the island had run out. It was time for the family to seek new business ventures where the I don't take sides approach would be more accepted. It turned out the best offer came from France's King Louis XIV, who quote, immediately agreed to all of his terms. Finally, he would live in a place where there wouldn't be a late 18th century revolution. Oh. Oh no, come on, France! Anyway, the Roach family had relocated to Dunkirk by 1789, and things quickly went downhill. In a major case of deja vu, the family refused to participate in the revolution due to their pacifist religion, and for a second time, Roach was called in front of the legislature to answer for his disloyalty. As war became inevitable, the Roach family decided they needed to leave France to ensure their safety. It was good timing as they happened to arrive in Wales the day after King Louis and Marie Antoinette were both executed. Yikes! Roach chose to move to Milford Haven in Wales precisely because it would be far away from any political conflict. Unfortunately, the family's dress and ability to speak French made their new neighbors suspicious that they were spies. In the end, the Roaches decided to publish a warning in a local newspaper, cautioning residents of Milford Haven to keep their distance. Talk about a great first impression! To make matters worse, Milford Haven soon became one of the largest shipbuilding centers for the Royal Navy, as the war between England and France intensified. This spooked Roach, who decided he had just about had enough of Europe and its seemingly constant conflict. He ended up arriving back on Nantucket in 1794, but the reunion didn't work as planned. Whaling had changed quite a bit since the 1770s, and ships needed to be larger than Nantucket's ports allowed. Plus, we're still angry they left us in the first place. Gah! In the end, Roach decided to move to New Bedford, eventually leading it into a new generation of whaling that would allow it to become the richest town in America. His family still kept an attachment to Nantucket, and his wife even insisted that born on Nantucket be inscribed on her tombstone. However, they would never live on the island again. Although the Roaches were economically secure after their relocation in New Bedford, they did face accusations and revenge plots from two prominent founding fathers, who still didn't trust them after their neutrality in the Revolutionary War. The first of these accusations came while the Roaches were in France. At that time, Thomas Jefferson accused Roach of treason at the highest level. This was after a war on foreign oil ended with the U.S. in much worse shape, while the Roaches essentially had French markets to themselves. The accusation died down until years later after William Roach's retirement, when John Adams told a Massachusetts newspaper to reprint the wartime treason charges against him, quote, word for word. Roach responded with an autobiography, which was an 89-page defense of his conduct during the wars. 
He also wrote a letter to Adams asking if the former president was just being malicious or feeling, quote, the effect of old age bordering on second childhood. In the end, no official action was taken against Roach, who lived until the age of 93 when he passed away in New Bedford. The effects of the Revolutionary War forever changed the whaling industry. The conflict convinced many Nantucketers, aside from William Roach, to move away and seek new business ventures. In the years to come, other whaling ports, which allowed larger ships, began to rival and surpass Nantucket. Still, whaling on the island continued to be the preferred occupation. After all, were we really going to rely on our farming expertise? After the revolution, Nantucket gradually rebounded, increasing the size of its whaling fleet to a modest 20 ships by 1802. But a second war, this time the War of 1812, crushed the whaling industry again, affecting the ports of New Bedford and Sag Harbor as well. Whaling continued successfully on Nantucket until the 1840s, when emigration accelerated again, especially from the working class. Then came the Great Fire of 1846, which along with the gold rush and discovery of petroleum, effectively closed the book for whaling on the island. Even without the Revolutionary War then, there were reasons that Nantucket's pre-war whaling success couldn't continue forever. Still, whaling defined much of our island's history, allowing it to have a global presence and play a significant role during a critical time of American history. Mm -hmm.